to you all and a very warm welcome in the lovely city of Rotterdam. Welcome to this EPP Congress and welcome to the EPP meeting of the Committee of the Regions. My name is Wietzke Posma, I'm a former Member of Parliament and I will be your moderator during this session. I wish you all a very warm welcome for the people who are here with us uh, in this room but also the people who are here uh, online and especially a warm welcome to our Ukrainian friends who are here with us today and with us online as well. It's amazing to see how many of you, how many EPP regional um, local leaders have supported the, our friends in the Ukraine. They've kept people together, they've provided the basic needs for the refugees and we're standing there defending freedom and democracy in their country. I would like to give a special warm welcome for the speakers today. There is interpretation provided in French, Ukrainian and English. And I would give a small recommendation to the speakers to stick to the five minutes that we have provided. We've got a very nice program with you today, for you today, talking about Ukraine, some very special guests who you will see soon in the free panel session. But first I would like to give a very Warm welcome to Mr. Olgit Geblevich, President of the EPP Committee of the Regions Group and President of the West Romanian Region. I'd like to give the floor to you. Well, thank you very much, dear colleagues, dear friends. It's a great honor and, of course, pleasure uh, for me to welcome you in this EPP uh, local dialogue. It takes place in this outstanding context of uh, the Congress of our political family, the EPP. Uh, not just a simple meeting, but uh, the moment to take grand decisions about the leadership of our party and to discuss the EPP line in the immense challenges and shocks that European Union is facing. This local dialogue wouldn't, be, wouldn't have been possible without the fantastic help and support of our colleagues and friends uh, from Christian Democratic Appeal of the Netherlands. So, thank you well, Helen Nauta, she will speak in a few minutes on behalf of her party. Thank you well, Witzke Potsma, our excellent moderator, who will help the smooth development of the panels ahead of us. And of course, thank you very much to all our distinguished guests and speakers, including our friends from Ukraine. Welcome to the local dialogue of the EPP group in the European Committee of Regions. This is your house and we are more than ever united by our common values of members of the largest and strongest political family in European Union. The war in Ukraine and its repercussions evolve at the lightning speed. We have to keep up with extremely fast pace of events, mobilizing our own regional and local resources in a matter of days, where previously it took weeks or months so to provide aid for the Ukrainian people in need. Every day we hear shocking news 
about death, devastation, atrocities, Ukrainian flees their house. We express our deepest grief about the loss of life and human suffering caused by Russian indiscriminate brutality. We stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine who are defending their country against Russian invaders. I align to what Ursula von der Leyen said last month in front of local leaders of Ukraine. Dear friends, dear sisters and brothers, we are an inspiration for so many around the world. We are with you in a spirit and with a concrete support. For weeks now, Ukraine is being slowly destroyed. We cannot let it happen. The Ukrainian government looks forward to rebuilding key infrastructures, schools, hospitals, roads, houses, so that many millions of refugees can return to their safe homes. Beyond massive financial support from institutional donors, particularly the EU, Ukrainian partners are asking for know-how, best available technologies and expertise. The mechanism for reconstruction will include a strong subnational element such, a, such as twinning be, between, twinnings between cities and regions in Ukraine and in the EU. We must be on the side of our Ukrainian partners on their path to the European Union. For every damaged city, there must be at least another one, twin city in Europe. On every Ukrainian oblast, we have to have at least one European supporting region, just like Mari region, West Pomeranian region supports Mykolaiv oblast. So we can make that happen and we are at work to make it happen. In this regard, I wish to highlight here a strong leadership of our president, Tsitsi Kostas, who reshaped the priorities of his presidency precisely to meet this new unexpected, unexpected needs. We have to bear in mind that decentralization and regional development reforms in the recent years in Ukraine contributed significantly to the consolidation of local democracy, strengthened self-governance, and overall resilience of the country's local communities. They are a crucial element for Ukrainian resilience against Russian invaders. The war has also created new challenges for our cities and regions, particularly in terms of energy security. Therefore, we need urgently to diversify our energy resources and our energy suppliers as a response to Russian atrocities committed to in Ukraine, it blackmail, but also as an impetus to speed up the implementation of European Green Deal, making our local communities climate neutral by 2050. Green transition is real. Green transition is possible. And we have a plenty of good examples to share. For example, I'm very proud that my region, West Pomeranian region, uses more than 82% of energy from renewable resources. Thanks to our support, our regional support, and of course, support from the EU funds. And today we will also listen to inspiring examples of the EPP-led cities and regions who are pioneers in energy transition. Dear colleague, the EPP local and regional leaders need to act now. 
we need to continue pushing for a full ban on imports of Russian gas and oil in Europe as soon as possible, as it's case in coal. We also need to abandon completely Nord Stream and Nord Stream 2 projects and focus on the greater energy efficiency, greater savings, and mentioned in the recently published to power EU plan, and quicker rollout renewable energy in our communities. Only by working together and speaking with one voice, we can use this current context to make decisive choices for our regions, cities, and villages become more resilient, sustainable, and dynamic places to live and work for us, for our citizens, and of course, for our children. I wish you fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to welcome Manfred Weber, who joined us in this moment. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for your words. Like you said, we are in the phase that we do face grand decisions that we need to take with strong leadership. And you've given some good examples of the Twin Cities, but also about how we can use renewable energy uh, to gain strength as Europe. A uh, very warm, warm welcome to uh, Manfred Weber as well. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, I would first like to welcome uh, Mrs. Ellen uh, Nauta, who is chairwoman of the Dutch delegation of the Committee of the Regions and also mayor of the lovely region of Hof van Twente, which is in the east of the Netherlands for those who would like to visit. Thank you, Witzke. Good morning to all guests present here today. A special welcome to the representatives of the Ukraine. Mr. Boychenko, who is over there, my colleague from Mariupol, and Mrs. Yerorova Luchenko of the Kharkiv Regional Council, and also all other guests, Mr. Weber and others. It is with much pride that after the kind and interesting opening words of the president of the EPP group in the Committee of the Regions, Mr. Geblevich, I may also welcome you on behalf of the Dutch delegation to the committee. The Dutch delegation consists of 12 members and their alternates, originating from Dutch municipalities and provinces. Together, we work within the framework of the committee on several topics. I briefly mention a few. Strategic autonomy and interconnectivity. Due to the fast changes in a highly connected world economy, we feel the urge to become less dependent on, for example, China and Russia when it comes to vital economic sectors such as food, energy and industries. Secondly, the relationship between governance and cities, citizens. In Europe, and also in the world, democracies, the rule of law, and our fundamental values are under pressure. The relationship with our citizens is of vital importance and, if well taken care of, can counter this tide. In Holland, we therefore invest, for example, in youngsters, in dialogue, and in the Conference on the Future of Europe. Thirdly, the interweaving of the green and digital transition. This interweaving is increasing year by year and will influence European laws and regulations, as well as, for example, the combat for climate neutral cities and regions. And finally, the focus on and attention for the consequences of conflicts, natural disasters and crisis for local communities in Europe and the world. Based on these global topics, the Dutch delegation to the committee has special attention for the consequences for our Dutch local communities when it comes to the European cohesion policy, the long-term policies for rural areas, the smart cities activities, Green Deal, European governance, the rule of law, and other policy areas. We are proud to be active members of the committee for us, the Committee of the Regions and all that it stands for and works on is important and indispensable. The Committee brings Europe closer to its citizens, 
due to the hard work of its members and our presidents, and due to the commitment of the EPP within the committee. Thanks to our European EPP family, we can make a difference for our citizens. Let me close by stating that I'm also proud that the committee has intensified contacts with our Ukrainian friends from the beginning of this unjust, cruel and inhumane war. Although the solution of this meaningless conflict is not entirely in our hands, the least we can do is stand in solidarity with our friends and colleagues who are facing the severe consequences every day. The least we can do is asking our governments to be committed to end this war every day and relentlessly. Today, we will do so again as EPP family. Thank you, and on behalf of the Dutch delegation, I wish you an inspiring, committed and binding Congress. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for your words. And thank you as well, uh, both of you, for co-hosting this, uh, this dialogue. We have, of course, as big topic for today, cities and regions standing with Ukraine. And we've divided in three parts. The first will be building a European future for Ukraine, solidarity and practice, and building resilient, sustainable and energy independent cities and regions. Well, first of all, I would like to um, welcome Mr. Weber on the stage. And I have a special warm welcome as well for Ms. Yahorova Lutsenko, who I would like to welcome on the stage as well. And online with us is Vadim Bochenko, who I would like to welcome today to the meeting. Just have to... Yes, please. So thank you very much. I would like to... So, so sorry. I would like to first of all uh, welcome our guests for the, for the first uh, panel. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Yehorova Luchenko. She's head of the Kharkiv Regional Council. And we would express our honor for you to be here. We have online visible now, Mr. Vadim Bochenko, uh, of course, mayor from Mariupol, the city that has become a symbol of their heroic resistance. It's become a symbol of the heroic resistance of the Ukraine people against Russia, against the Russian brutality. The whole world has followed the fight of Afsostol sight, and not only that. With one voice and one soul, the members of the EPP group in the European Committee of the Regions welcome our guests, our speakers of Ukraine today, as part of the European family. We share the same fundamental values of freedom, peace, democracy, and safeguarding of human rights. The unprovoked and unjustified invasion of the free nation of Ukraine by the Russian Federation Army is a criminal act against the people of Ukraine. Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, the freedom of Ukraine for self-determination and a brutal violation of democratic principles and the rule of law. The EPP regional and local leaders stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine who are defending their country against the Russian invaders. Millions of refugees have reached the European Union with numbers rising every day. From these refugees, many are children. Cities and regions provide first aid and shelter for Ukrainian refugees in many cities and regions across Europe. I would like to point out that the need to have a long-term vision not only an emotional and emergency reactions to recent events is needed. And according to Ukraine, the medium term and long term vision includes reconstruction, 
which must be carried out with the participation of European local and regional authorities, and possibly with the help of sister cities in the EU. Tatiana Yohorova Lutsenko and Vadim Bochenko, you are the grassroots leaders across Ukraine. You know best what your citizens need in your towns and in the region. You will be the builders and organizers on the ground, the local link through building your new Ukraine and local and regional leaders in the EU are best placed to understand your needs and offer practical, concrete and operational expertise. It is therefore a special honor for me to welcome two high level guest speakers that will lead us into the actual situation of the war, the conditions of the Ukraine people, and the perspectives to the future. And it's twice a privilege to welcome this debate, the candidate president of the EPP, Mr. Manfred Weber. I would like to, uh, Mr. Bochenko, to have a special warm welcome to you. Um, and I would like to ask you to, to give us an update of the situation that you have in Mariupol right now. Uh, of course, we're very concerned um, with how it is. So please, I would like to give the floor to you. Thank you. Welcome, dear European community. Thanks a lot for the opportunity provided to me to tell you about the, uh, in the voice of our heroic city, what the situation is like now. At the beginning of the speech, I would like to ask the main question. What is the European future now, personally, for our heroic Mariupol? That very Mariupol that is 90% destroyed by the Russian invasion, invaders. That very Mariupol in which the invaders have killed more than 20,000 civilians, women, children, elderly people. Over the recent eight months, we have been building modern European city with comfortable parks and squares, with modern schools and hospitals, with new public transport that already had well repaired infrastructural objects and roads. We were building this together with the European community, together with you. The success and progress of Mariupol was our joint victory because more than uh, 200 million euros of investment were involved in the development of our city. Our partners included the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, European Investment Bank, the Treasury of uh, France, NAFCO, and a lot of other international partners. But our joint European future was destroyed by the other world, the world which unfortunately doesn't know the word democracy, the world which unfortunately doesn't know what freedom and the freedom of choice in particular is. The world that understands only the uh, language of destructions, atrocities. That is the so-called uh, Ruski Mir or Pax Rusika. The antagonism of the modern democratic society and the world. Mariupol, over the last eight years, was the leader in terms of implementation of European values has come to know all the atrocities and all the ruthlessness of this brutal, bloody and very terrible war. That war happened only because we chose a different view of our life, a different path. The fight of Mariupol and the whole of our Ukraine is the fight for our common, democratic, free future. That is about the future of Ukraine as a part of the civilized world, and this is the future of all of us. And war is closer to all of us than it seems to some people. The war is already in the European continent. While speaking about the future of our city, we need to start with our victory, the victory of Ukraine over this evil, over the Russian invaders. It is the victory of Ukraine that will 
mark the beginning of our joint, safe and democratic future. That is the beginning of a new story where there is no place for tyranny, imperialism and real fascism of the 21st century. That is the beginning of the history where Ukrainian Mariupol would be a part of the European community. But we need support from European countries. We need more resistance to really protect our European values, our lives and our freedom, which is the main thing, our independence. We need more decisive economic sanctions against Russia for us to be able to stop feeding this military machine. We need a full embargo of Russia on Russian oil and gas. And behind those political decisions, unfortunately, there are millions of lives of our heroes, of Ukrainians. Every day of delay leads to immense consequences and high cost. It's much more than tens of, of um, thousands of euros. Unfortunately, Ukrainians are now paying a high price. This is the price which they pay in the form of their freedom of their lives. They pay for the freedom of their whole world. They pay not with money, but with their own lives. We are paying the highest cost. So I, I want all of us to realize that I, as the mayor of Mariupol, really grateful to you for the support provided by our European partners, ranging from humanitarian assistance up to military assistance, which is all the more important. Each of your decision, each standpoint of yours develops a very good foundation on which we intend to build social and free future of our country, Ukraine. And I'm sure that it is with your support that Ukraine will definitely win the way light wins over darkness. Peace will get back to our heroic city of Mariupol. I've realized that this is not going to be easy. We're going to face tough times. But the main thing is that it will definitely happen. And this will happen after our victory, after Mariupol is liberated. After that, we will liberate, we will liberate it and we will rebuild a modern European city. Already now we are developing a strategy for the revival and reconstruction of Mariupol. And the point is not only, the point is only about the fact whether we are alone or we are, as always, within our European family. Unfortunately, Russia has destroyed Mariupol. It has brought into our city only death and destructions. The countries of the civilized world may bring to Mariupol life and development. That is going to be our rebuff to the in our react response to the Russian invasion. The response on behalf of the common European future. And that will be victory of life over death. Victory of a free and democratic world over this imperial, imperialistic worldview. Thanks a lot to you. Um, uh, glory to heroes of Mariupol and glory to Ukraine. Well, thank you very much for, for your words. And I think you've expressed very well in, in the darkness that you are now with your city and the citizens. And it is time to bring the light and offer our help. Um, and I think one of the most important things that we need to do is not only help on the short term, like you said, but also consider the long-term strategy. I would like to ask uh, Mr. Weber, who is here, uh, candidates for the European, uh, for the EPP presidency, um, to give a reaction, please, on the, the words and the, and the comments. 
Yeah, dear friends, um, it is extremely difficult in these times to directly react after we got such a report and such a, an appeal to us from our friends in Ukraine, because our contribution seems to be so, so small. Uh, having in mind that uh, our Ukrainian friends are fighting our fight. Having in mind that this is not a fight uh, between Russia or a war between Russia and Ukraine alone. On the ground, yes, it is. But it is a fight from Putin and the dictatorship in Moscow against uh, us, against all of us. And that's why, again, the first reaction seems always to be very difficult for us. What can I say in such a situation? But if our words are, are probably not easy because you are suffering so much currently and you're fighting a brave fight. And I'm sometimes also reflecting. I don't know how you think about this, but what would I do in such a situation now? Would I stand up and fight for my values? So just to reflect for ourselves. So probably this gives us an indication about how brave, how strong, how, how, how engaged our friends are. Though. And I want to pay uh, uh, deep respect for what are you doing there. Again, having this in mind, our small contribution, it must give us a motivation to be then strong on our uh, steps we can do on our side. And that's why uh, some of the issues are already mentioned. When it is about the sanctions, we have to be tough on these economic sanctions. And I want to underline that the first five packages we made on European level are strong. We were together, even on global level, with our friends in, in Canada, in America, in Japan. So we were together and we showed strength as the Western world. Now the sixth package this night agreed on the council level was not easy to manage, but even this, I would say, let's let's underline we are ready. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen today said that at the end of the years we will reduce oil from Russia by around 90%. That is ambitious. That is good. That is what we are doing. Putin is destroying on the long run each and every economic perspective for his country. He has no chance anymore to survive with this economy. So that is what he is doing currently. So there we are united and strong. Also the budgetary support because for the mayors in in Ukraine, it's so important to simply have currently resources, money to do the job and economy is going out of the country, investments are not anymore there. So that's why everybody understands that the economic demand, the money, the budgetary demand demands are so high. That's why the 9 billion euros this night agreed on the council level to support our Ukraine friends is so urgently needed. It's not a moment where we count each and every euro. It's simply a moment where we have to support our Ukraine friends in this moment of history. So that is already good what we are doing there. I would um, add that uh, the most important thing next to the budget and also to the sanctions is absolutely the weapons questions. So there we are struggling that we have not a European approach, we have national uh, decisions on the table. I can only tell you that I am really angry about uh, uh, the socialist, the German chancellor, for example, Olaf Scholz, who didn't show any kind of leadership, didn't show any kind of determination of readiness to give clear signal that Germany as one of the countries inside of the European Union is on the side of our Ukraine friends. He was only pushed by the public opinion to do the steps. And we are a party, dear friends. Let's be honest. The socialists, there is still all over Europe, the Russian friendly network there, that is there. Mm -hmm. And that's why let's be proud about EPP because we are pushing all over Europe for full solidarity and for also delivering of heavy weapons to our Ukraine friends. It's necessary. It's now necessary and not in a few months. That is another aspect where we are, where we have to be clear. I want to add that um, this um, whole war is bringing us to further considerations. Olga, I listened at the end to your contribution today. And when it is about energy, it's obvious that we that the war is now pushing us and assisting us and giving us further arguments to speed up on the Fit for 55, to go further on the climate change. We will vote in the European Parliament next week on the Fit for 55 package. And we as EPP stick to the 55 approach, 55% approach. We stick to an ambitious approach. We have to speed up. That creates a future where we are more independent, where we have cheaper energy in that of the European Union. That's a good future, which we will go in the next years. And we have to do it together. Like you said it, in your intervention, local communities and European level, national level, we have to do it together. And uh, if I also may add this uh, war, where I must clearly say that one of the aims of the clear directions is 
that Putin must lose this war. That must be the clear aim. Why, dear friends? Because if he wins, or if he would partly win, mm -hmm. then autocrats all over the world will be motivated to go further. Mm -hmm. We will wake up in a totally different world. Only to mention China and Taiwan. Everybody knows what I mean. No? That's why he cannot win. He must lose. That's our goal together. And that is what we have to fight for. And uh, there the EPP, and I'm, I'm proud about this, is a strong and a united political family in these points. Also on the council side, in the parliament, national parliament, and especially in the regions and uh, on the local ground. And as a final point, allow me next to this very fundamental point on Ukraine, uh, let me thank all of you for your engagement in the EPP format to work uh, for strong voice of our local communities. Uh, um, I would say, having in mind that EPP is today the mayor's party of Europe, the governor's party of Europe, we are strong on the local ground. We have, we have a lot of people who have the direct trust of the citizens. Uh, to be elected on the local ground means a lot democratically. That's why we as family, we can be proud about having such a strong uh, group in the Committee of Regions. I want to thank Olger for his uh, work. He's a strong ambassador of, uh, of our group uh, in the EPP family. I see Apostolos sitting, sitting in front of me, the president of the Committee of Regions, a strong representatives, a strong voice, and sometimes a demanding voice who is asking a lot, but that is his role and he's doing there a great job. And again, I'm really proud that we have in the EPP such a strong uh, 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 team uh, on the Committee of Regions. We have the feet on the ground, that is what we have as EPP. We know what is going on because we are every day in contact with people. That's why thank you so much. And thank you also for this strong message of solidarity with our Ukraine friends. Thank you very much. And especially like you said, we are the people that have the feet on the ground. We have the direct contact with all the citizens there. Um, Ms. Jehorva Kublensko, uh, I would like to ask you, you are um, head of the Kharkiv region and you were on a cool Russian fire in the first few days of the war. Is there still an imminent danger for your region posed by the Russian invaders? Yeah. Is the mic working? First of all, I would like to pass my regards to Vadim, mayor of Mariupol. Keep holding on. So I've traveled many miles to be here today. You could not have done that. So you are joining us over Zoom. Unfortunately, our men cannot leave the territory of the country. Our men have to stay in the country. But I feel your pain because we share the same pain with you. Dear colleagues, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude to uh, Mr. President and also uh, to the EPP Council of, of Regions Group. Ukraine has selected its path not today, not yesterday, and not on the 24th of February. We have selected the European path. We are the same people as you are. I'm the same woman as you are. I also have children just like you, just like you do. And we don't want to be destroyed by Russia. And the people of Ukraine, together with its president, will fight until the end, until the last drop of blood. Be sure in our victory. It's not my first time being here at this meeting, thanks to the president of at first, I even came here wearing black clothes. Today, I'm wearing white. And I'd like to assert that Ukraine is strong and our regions are already working on the development of strategies for rebuilding the cities and towns. It's hard for us to fight our fight alone in war, and it will also be hard for us to rebuild the cities by ourselves. 
as far as Kharkiv region is concerned, I would like to mention the following. On the 9th of May, this landmark day, we had a session of Kharkiv Regional Council, and all the deputies of Kharkiv Regional Council have made the decision uh, to designate Russia as the aggressor. Even though Kharkiv region is very close to the border with Russia, we have very many people in the region that are Russian speakers, but nobody was ready to what was about to happen to the region and to our country. That's why all the deputies of the regional council designated Russia as the aggressor and no occupation or no referendums would not be acknowledged by our deputies. On the 26th of May, just very recently, several days ago, I was having a meeting, even though we were having complicated situation, I was working on site and heard shelling right in the city center. So, what do we have as a result? Nine casualties, a kid, five months old infant. It was just several days ago. We are getting used to that, but we don't want to get used to living like this, to go to the bomb shelters. Our children understand that they need to hide when the air raid alarm is off, but we continue our work and after the armed forces of Ukraine have liberated many settlements in Kharkiv region, 600,000 of our residents have come back. More than a million have left and 600,000 are already back. And it's a testament that it will be easier for you as well because these people have been staying in your countries in Europe, but our people want to return home very important for us because we are waiting for them but the important thing is that it's safe to come back as far as Kharkiv region is concerned and the rebuilding of the region and the country so two days ago president Zelensky visited the region he examined those districts that were destroyed by Russians completely that is why people cannot come back to them together with the city mayor Mr. Terehov we are currently helping the people staying in the underground. I'm sure you have seen that. So these people are getting accommodation in the dormitories, other sanatoriums, so that they have temporary accommodation. We are providing them with everything they need. And I would like to express my particular gratitude to our international partners because the humanitarian aid that we've been receiving has been essential. It helps us to supply people with everything they need. After the visit of the president to the region, he has outlined an action plan. The war is going on, but we are already thinking about rebuilding. We have a strategy for each of the regions. We have identified the number of buildings destroyed, and we have ascertained the funding that will be required. So we are working daily, of course, with the support of our international partners. I would like to support the initiative mentioned by Sister Costas and uh, our first speaker, uh, the initiative of the twinning cities. This is very important. I know that you have a twinning region, Kharkiv region has a twinning region, the Kopolski Voivodeship in Poland. And uh, two weeks ago, uh, we signed an agreement with one of the French regions. So I would like to mention that for us, mayors, your support is very important. Partnership does not have to deal with economy only, with the funding. The moral support is no least important. Humanitarian aid is very important. The fact that you receive our citizens is also very important. So these are the main directions in which we are working as the regional government. Establishing cooperation with the international partners, inventory of the damage caused by the invaders. And what is also very important that was mentioned by the president, 
receiving some international guarantees to the rebuilding of our region. So that is if to be real. But I would like to express my gratitude and I wish everybody full cooperation. Thank you for supporting Ukraine. Well, thank you very much. I think you stressed very well that a child should never get used to running to bomb shelters when the alarm goes off. And I think you asked very clearly, like Mr. Gebrevich said uh, at the beginning, for the help of the Twin Cities as a, a very good way of not only uh, getting um, emotional support, but also support in all the ways. And I would like to thank you very much for coming here because you've traveled a long way. And I think it must be very hard for you to leave your country behind in a situation like that, to leave your um, family behind. And so thank you very much for that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Weber, I have one more question for you. We stressed uh, the importance of the Twin Cities, of the support that we can give here with, uh, with the regions. Um, could you please give a reflection uh, on that? Well, in such an emotional moment, uh, when we see the attacks, when we see what is destroyed there, I think the emotional perspectives that individuals, that people care, that among cities we care, is probably more important than big speeches from big politicians. That's why the idea is a great one. I thank you so much for the initiative to present this and to make this now happening. Um, and uh, I think this direct uh, contact also is uh, on practical terms important because when it is about humanitarian assistance, when it is about also giving probably migrants an, an, an access and also an, an anchor point in a way where they can, that they can come to, this is easier to be organized than on the local base because again, feeds on the ground you know, to be then organized there than, uh, than on, 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 on national or even European level. And uh, I learned this when I had the chance to visit, for example, the migration, the migrants camps and the welcome centers in the European soil. Um, I was in Warsaw, for example, I was the mayor of Warsaw, Warsaw uh, in front of us. Uh, and uh, when you are there and when you are speaking there with people, you, de you really get a good idea about what is happening there. And that the main, let me say, effort, the main burden is managed by the local communities, by the regions, not so much by national, like in Poland, for example, uh, is, uh, is, really, is really impressive to see. That's why all these driving contacts are great initiatives and if EPP is picking this up as a main initiative from our side, we can be proud about this. So Rafael, you did it in Warsaw, in a lot of cities we are doing so, and, uh, and, and that's great. If you allow me, I want to welcome the former president of the European Parliament, Antonio Tajani, who is with us. Antonio, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I would like to give a, a last thanks to the speakers that we've had. Mr. Bochenko, uh, who's uh, joined us through Zoom, uh, Mrs. Johorova Lutsenko, and Mr. Manfred Weber. Thank you very much for your contribution. I would uh, like to invite uh, three other guests to come to the floor, please. Uh, that is Rafał Traskowski, Mayor of uh, Warsaw, Emil Bock, Mayor of Napolia, and Roman Linek, Vice President of the Partibin region. Hello, nice to see
I would uh, like to start with the, the second part, which is solidarity with Ukraine. Uh, this is also the part where we have a pan panelist here and where we would like you to ask questions. So if you're here in the room and have questions, they can uh, be asked right at the end. So be ready for them. And there's also a possibility if you're online to contribute to the meeting by asking your questions in the chat and then they will be reached here and be asked as well. So once the, the war started in February in Ukraine, we've of course seen a lot of power from the regions, uh, the different regions that we have, the ones very close to Ukraine, like uh, uh, the city of Warsaw, um, who had immediately uh, a big refugee um, a stream coming to the city. And they responded very adequately, as we've all uh, seen. So I would first like to uh, introduce uh, the mayor of Warsaw, uh, Mr. Traskowski. And thank you very much for, uh, for coming. I think you've hosted well over 300,000 refugees in your city. Um, and as I understood correctly, that's more than 15% increase of the population of your city. And we've, I think, all seen the, the, the images, the pictures of the people arriving and the very well set up um, welcome with the accommodation, the sanitary facilities, food, medical, psychological assistance, which I think has been quite a challenge to set up. Um, so I'm very interesting from, you responded immediately to the situation. My first question would be from the first day, what was the first thing that you did as a mayor of your city, seeing all the refugees come to your city? Thank you well. Good morning. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to, to, to be here in Rotterdam, especially in Ahoy. I come here every year for North Sea Jazz Festival, which is one of the best ah. in the world. So I'll be back in a month. Anyhow, guys, uh, on a serious matter, f first of all, thank you very much for, for the invitation. And uh, the thing is, I I'll start with one thing, you know, that there are some, the, the, I was just uh, talking to some experts about different nature of different crises. And uh, they were differentiating between crises and, and, and most importantly, between those which were expected and unexpected, those which were creeping and those which happened suddenly and so on and so forth. And I think that we do have a problem with definition because we knew in Poland it was coming. And we were actually telling our friends, you know, I was a member of the European Parliament. I worked in the European Parliament before I was a minister of European integration. And for years we were saying, okay, guys, wake up because we are dealing with a thug. We are dealing with, with a guy who is completely unpredictable. And when we were trying to set up uh, the uh, energy union in the European Union, many people were looking at us and they were saying, you're obsessed with Russia. What, why? We don't need that. Mm -hmm. So why am I telling you that? Because we were not surprised. We were, we were not, we were not uh, taken aback by what happened. Of course, no one expected a crisis of that dimension. And I was in Kiev just four days before the war started to talk to Vitaly Klitschko, and we all expected there, there would be a, a conflict, but we thought it's going to be uh, another hybrid war. We didn't, we didn't expect an all-out war, but we were preparing for it. So uh, we had a crisis uh, situation meeting just the day before the war, and we, uh, we, we, we had a brainstorming session, and we decided to set up information points at two uh, railway stations, Warsaw East and Warsaw West, in order to be prepared. And then, boom, the next day, the war started. So, so the next day, we established those welcome, welcoming centers, and we were ready to actually welcome uh, our Ukrainian friends on, on, the day, uh, on the day one of the war. And, of course, at the beginning, most of the people who came to Warsaw, you know, they were taken care of by their family, by their friends. Mm -hmm. So out of thousands who were coming, uh, just... Don't il y avait vraiment beaucoup de Crâniens qui arrivaient chez nous et nous leur donnons de l'eau et de, de l'aide, bien sûr, au niveau euh, médical. Et on a vraiment commencé à penser au logement, au, 
préparer tous les logements pour les accueillir. Et bien sûr, la situation a changé dans, pendant une semaine parce qu'il euh, y avait besoin de cette aide. Alors, euh, tu dis qu'on euh, était vraiment euh, préparé euh, et euh, bien sûr, euh, mais vous avez beaucoup plus de réfugiés que prévu, en fait. Euh, quel est le système donc, de régularisation de l'Union européenne? Oui, bien sûr. Bien sûr. Euh, on, on a dû improviser aussi. Et... Sorry to interrupt. Veronica, you're speaking. Uh, and, uh, and most of the job was done by the... Uh people themselves, by non-governmental organizations, and of course by local governments as well. The government, the central government did its job on the border, but then it was really late in coming um, to assist us. And the biggest problem is that there is no strategy. And, uh, and you know, we've been calling for one for the past three, three months. I will probably, uh, in the course of the discussion, give you examples, for example, about education and so on and so forth. But yes, we need a European strategy. We need a voluntary relocation scheme. I mean, all the quotas that we discussed in 2015-16 are dead. You know, that's the dead fish in the water. But there are many pledges coming from different countries. Uh, the Netherlands was one of the first to actually come to uh, assistance. Uh, and we simply need to coordinate it better because we need a structured approach. We cannot improvise anymore uh, because most of the people are at people's homes. Uh, and simply people took the, their Ukrainian friends in, but many of them cannot do it indefinitely. They agreed to do it for a few months, but what if in a month or two, they will say, you know, I cannot do it anymore. Uh, we need to be prepared for that. And we also need to be prepared for any scenario which might unravel in Ukraine, in because we don't know what's going to happen. The situation might stabilize, but it might also escalate. So we need a, you're calling for a mid-term strategy and also a long-term of strategies thinking at the same time. What do we do with the refugees that are here now? Like you said, they've been um, very well, um, uh, they've been with families now, but the time's running out. But the short-term strategy has to turn into mid-term and long-term. Um, Do you consider the EU funding to be enough for what you are doing? Or is it something that you said from, well, we need more of that? Or is it more the strategy that you're actually concerned with? Well, I mean, the most important strategy, I'm, I'm just going to give you one example. Uh, day two of the war, we went to uh, see the Minister of Education. Uh, we don't have a, an easy relation with this guy because he comes, he's the most conservative of the conservative of the crazy government, you know. Mm. So, and, and of course, he just wanted to introduce inter indoctrination in schools. So we do have a problem with this guy, but you know, we approached him in goodwill and told him, listen, we need a strategy. Uh, we cannot accept all the kids who come to Warsaw uh, immediately in our schools because we don't know how many we'll, we, will, we will have. And now we have around 60, 80,000 kids in Warsaw alone, maybe even 100,000 in Warsaw and, and the counties around it. We have 280,000 kids in our schools, Polish kids. So we've enrolled already more than almost 20,000 kids into our kindergartens and schools, but we cannot do it indefinitely. So we said, listen, how about the majority of our Ukrainian friends will do online learning on a Ukrainian platform, and then we will teach them Polish gradually, and then maybe accept them to our school system and accept directly only those who are prepared, speak a bit of Polish, because otherwise it doesn't make any sense. And the government doesn't, didn't accept any strategy, didn't do any strategy. They, they simply said, you know, we, I mean, the online thing is not our thing. You know, we are not going to organize it. So I do have a problem planning long term. And even if someone comes and asks me, how can I help? If there is no strategy, how am I supposed to answer that question? If we do online learning that I need IT solutions, I need more computers. If I am to accept more and more in my schools, then I, of course, need completely different kind of assistance. So that's the problem. That's why we need a strategy. And answering your question, this is the biggest paradox ever. I haven't seen a dime of EU money yet. I've seen American money through uh, UNICEF and so on. And, and Americans are simply you know, paying the UN agencies, which is a good idea because then it goes directly to refugees, non-governmental mm -hmm. organizations, and local governments. And for example, we hire Ukrainian teachers to help us out in schools. 
teaches from among the refugees. So you're killing, you know, two birds with one stone. It's a very good solution. So we have that money, European money? No, not yet. Which is, which is, and of course, the European Union, I understand the European Commission because it, it doesn't have an additional budget. So it simply says, use the money that is already there. Okay. And the regional fund, and that's the only money I see because I don't see the government's money. They don't show it to us. They don't say what's committed, what's not committed. There's only 4 million euros for the whole region. That's the money we can use. I mean, if you talk about using unused funds and front loaning is not gonna help us either. And the last thing I wanna say, and that's what we are fighting for, is that at least some of the money should be uh, used directly by cities and local governments who are dealing with this problem. And that's by the way, the position of the Committee of the Regions. We've did it when it came to the green funding, but this is, equally important when it comes to refugees, because we are the first front of every conflict you want. Green, greening of our economy, uh, dealing with pandemic, dealing with refugees, it's the cities which are the first front. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Emil Bok, you are mayor of Cluj-Napoca and former prime minister of Romania. Um, in Cluj-Napoca, you had the, the grassroots action of 13,000 people replying on Facebook, offering help. And I heard that this was something that actually never happened in your region before. And it was so effective and contagious in a good way that it started spreading all over Romania. And a lot of people, just citizens, uh, offered their help and offered um, first aid kits. Medical students um, were there. And um, they traveled to the border, actually giving those supplies to the Ukrainian people. Um, that must have been something that you found very impressive and something to be proud of, I believe. What was your role in, in uh, actually making this bigger, like um, that happens with grassroots? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, we have uh, three months of war but in the same time, three months of remarkable unity in response to the Russian invasion in Europe. And I'd like to underline what uh, President uh, Weber said before. We have this unity in Europe and the response of all governments due to the people's reaction. So I'm, to you, I'm, I'm answering to your question. Mm -hmm. Due to the people reactions all over the Europe, the governments are united and took a, stand, a, a strong point against Russian invasion. So I'm proud to be European citizens because our European citizens force our governments to do it in this, uh, in this way. And the, the second aspect is about victory. I'm looking for a strategic defeat of Russia. One that would ensure that Russia is, is incapable of mounting a similar attack again. And we have to be aware that we want to be sure to have the same definition of victory in Ukraine, European Union, and the United States. It's so important to understand the same thing by victory. And what President Weber said before, yes, we need a victory in order to be sure that no authoritarian regime will be again in place to, uh, to set our democracy and our European way of life. From that perspective, we found a, a strong and fantastic solidarity in our city all over Romania, in Poland, and Europe, all over Europe. So we just do it our job, which was easier having our citizen on, on, yeah. on board. In this very moment, I want to tell you that what means quite a little for us means a lot for Ukrainian people, for Ukrainian authorities. We took very seriously the message of President Zikostas. He took the decision to encourage the sister city partnership. We have a sister city partnership with uh, uh, Chernowitz, and we already sent a lot of support to four cities in Ukraine and other three cities in Moldova. And let's be honest, <clears throat> shall we answer to the question, can we have now or wait to the end of the world? My answer is now. Mm -hmm. We cannot wait until the end of the world in order to help the Ukrainian cities, because first they need day-to-day -day support meal and and so on second repair the critical infrastructure bridges hospitals education facilities and they need support and of course on the third level we need to work on how to rebuild the economy 
not based on Soviet model, based on European uh, model with green and resilient. So here I'm, I'm asking you to use the sister city partnership as was uh, done by President Tsitsikostas to help each region from Ukraine. And we have another model very, very good. We as a city, we have a sister cities partnership with many cities in Europe. Some cities in Europe do not have sister cities in Ukraine. So they use us as a bridge in order to help the Ukrainian cities. So we had the city of Dijon from France, the city of Cologne from Germany. Mm -hmm. They sent us money and materials and we used to send them to different parts in, in, uh, in Europe. So I think all these arguments should be used in order to improve that. I think you give a very good example of how practical this is. You say we partner with a city and we provide what is needed. And I hear you also say, because we've partnered, we know what is needed because we team up and we offer like a, a, a kind of hub function, function. You offer your help from other cities who can deliver to you to other cities. So I think this is a really nice example of how the partnership the cities is, is uh, you working another small out. example. Uh, one city from Ukraine asked us to send second-hand uh, trolleybus because mm -hmm. they have been affected on the public transport. So we sent three to five trolleybus from our city to them in order to have trans temporary, to help them to have the public transport in place. So any support is very welcome from small size to the bigger size. That's very nice and very fast and practical. Um, Mr. Linek, obviously you, you are Vice President of the Pardubis region in the Czech Republic and your region also immediately started delivering medical supplies, uh, gasoline generators, the, the very practical things and also the ten trucks filled with humanitarian aid. And um, you've actually grown quite well in that role and uh, increasingly helped more. And we were asking from what, from your point of view, is needed now for helping the Ukrainian citizens? Thank you for the invitation. Have a nice day for everybody. I think although for humanitarian and defense purposes, the Czechs collected in the first two weeks on conflicts almost 80 million euros, there is still a lot to be covered. I think the trends are changing. Uh, after a first wave about the big solidarity, I haven't met such solidarity in my country before. We must start thinking of sustainable help. Mm -hmm. And let me give a few numbers. Uh, Czech Republic has uh, around 10 and a half million inhabitants. Before the conflict lived in the Czech Republic, 200,000 Ukrainian workers with Czech or Polish permits, working permits. Since then came 360,000 refugees, of which it's more than the second biggest city you know, in our country. And uh, on, out of which uh, 150,000 are women, 128,000 are children and young people, and 12,000 are seniors. It's very good news that uh, recently I spoke with our Ministry for Social Affairs, almost 60,000 new refugees already found jobs. Wow. And it's nice that they're a little bit participate to the social and taxi system. Uh, but uh, because the most refugees are women with children and elderly, this puts big pressure, especially on healthcare system, social care benefits, and education system, especially the preschools and elementary schools. Yeah. But we, we accept it. Are you, are you offering online schooling as well? Yeah, yeah. it's both. It's up the up the refugees. They decided to use the online or the direct visit the schools, and we we manage it everything till now. But I think it's important to mention it's vital to strengthen and deepen cooperation between state, region, and cities in their distribution of information, responsibility, and material and finance finance support, yeah. and towards the EU. Uh, the state, I think, shall be a national coordinator with uh, good forming communication strategies based on first-hand information for regions and cities. Yeah, so you need a national coordinator and you're also saying that the Twin City is, is, is very effective. And what do you think long-term should be done? Let's see about I mentioned, most pressure, healthcare, social care, education, plus accommodation. I, I think it's distinguished among those who wish to return 
it's the best way. And those who wish to stay permanently and become, in our case, the Czech citizens. And these future citizens will have different needs. They need to learn language, get training, get the notification and find jobs or the, obtain the driving license or permits. But the long accommodation is really a big problem. And we have a very tangent, the, the housing, uh, housing market yeah. is expensive. And uh, I think the pressure on markets will be, will be really high. But the biggest challenge, I think, actual challenge is to keep social peace and natural solidarity in society of overall economic situation is getting worse, mm -hmm. including Czech Republic. And this could lead to this extremism supposed by the Russian cyber works and uh, disinformation campaign. But that, that's a very important yeah, point that yeah, you're I, stressing that you, for the long term, we need to also think about uh, the integration and, uh, of course, because the housing prices are going up, the prices of fuel are going up, that you put stress on the citizens as well. So it's a very important one to watch for the mid-long term. Um, are there any questions from the room? I would um, like to thank you for your contribution. I think it's um, it's really strong what you're doing. Of course, you've, this has happened. You've come into a role. Uh, you've seen it coming better than we have in, in the Netherlands, of course. So that's a big compliment to all of you. But you've acted on it. And I think you're building your, your way um, in, in the midterm strategy and making a long-term strategy. And that it's really important because you are, of course, so close to the Ukraine with your cities that we, um, as people from the region, from, from this part of Europe, keep a very close eye on you and also listen very well to the points that you've mentioned today. So thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you for being here. And thank you very much. I would like to ask the next guest to the table, please, uh, Mr. Frank Proust, Michel Rogier, <laughs> and Lydia Pereira. So. Welcome. Um, yeah. so. Well, thank you uh, very much for the guests uh, that we have here. Uh, the third panel session is about building a resilient, sustainable and energy independent cities, because that is, of course, the challenge that we're facing now. Uh, sustainability has always been an important part for us, for our group, but now uh, it's even more stressed, of course, by the high energy prices and gas prices, which affects our region economically, but also uh, the citizens. I would first like to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Frank Praus. He's president of the Nîmes Metropole. Um, and has been very busy with the, with the Green Deal. Uh, the, the area of Nîmes uh, in France is very committed to the climate transition. And uh, he's developed a territorial air, air energy climate plan. And he's, of course, holding the presidency, presidency of the Council of the European Union. And the Green Deal is one of his key priorities. Welcome. Now, the war in the Ukraine has created challenges for our cities and regions, and particularly in the energy security. And the Nîmes Metropole is very active in this. So could you please with, share with us, Mr. Prowse, uh, the plan that you have and the challenges and solutions that can be found at the European level? Yes, uh, dear friend, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. 
Uh, I'm sorry, but I go to uh, to speak in French because I, I want to use a, a, a right word. So if you can, uh, for the translation. Um, effectivement, on a beaucoup parlé. Yes, it is true that today we spoke about the consequences. Uh, I believe that this this war make us understand the urgency to speak about three fundamental issues our energy independency and also food independency it is true that the collective communities that we represent have this capacity to adapt and to react to these kind of situations and so it's true that uh, i have uh, created uh, a plan uh, territorial energetic plan based on uh, energy uh, autonomy uh, i have two example for this i have created a factory that allow me to produce biogas that is used for the buses in our city of course uh, in our region uh, our region is very sunny with the more than 300 uh, sun days we have also used uh, photovoltaic panels and we are going to to um, produce green hydrogen in order to give our contribution for the environment we can through this uh, strategy create hydrogen and therefore we can use it for uh, airplanes, uh, for trucks, uh, etc. And last point is the food independence. So we are working with the um, uh, stakeholders uh, in the agricultural sector. Also, we are working on uh, school canteens so that there can be the proximity between production and consumption of this agricultural product with uh, another challenge which is uh, paramount that uh, will be more and more difficult to manage especially for the countries uh, in the mediterranean basin which is uh, the management of the water resources and that is why in the framework of the green deal we can be efficient and include these kind of issues like the water resources management etc so thank you very much for it. you've not only done the sustainable part with the solar energy and the gas the biogas uh, but you've also on for the water resources, um, how did you play a role from the local and regional authorities? Because Nimes is part from France and you work together with the EU. What is really important to set something like this up so that other people can do this in their region? <clears throat> I believe that the communities, and we have seen that during the pandemics, the local communities, more than governments, have these uh, um, adaptation capacities and solutions must come from the base, from the bottom, uh, from the local dimension in order to try and solve uh, these issues but we must also try to uh, take some european decisions and i will explain sometimes we see some natural catastrophes like uh, floods which are very serious for the communities it is very difficult to try and build 
buildings in order to to stop this. So we need European funds, European aids. And the idea, uh, I was a, a member of the Parliament, uh, the European Parliament, the idea is to cooperate, to work with, together with the European Commission to see how the Green Deal, how we can uh, reduce the the road between the policy and the application of the policy. And sometimes the time between the two is two years. So the idea is to use the Committee of the Regions to, to see that when we need an urgent reaction, we can use a part of the budget of the Green Deal that can be used directly from the local communities. I believe that we don't use enough this uh, structure of the Committee of the Regions that could be uh, an interface between the European Union and the local community. I believe that if we want to be closer to Europe, we need efficacy, we need reactivity and visibility uh, with the European policies that too often uh, don't, uh, so we often don't understand that Europe must react rapidly. And when Europe help us, we must say it. And the best way to do it is to show that Europe is capable to solve the problems in a very effective, effective and uh, fast way through the Committee of the Regions. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for your uh, contribution. Um, it's, it's always a challenge, of course, of getting the, the big European budgets and programs into the practical work, but I think you've shown some good examples. So thank you very much for, uh, for that, for your contribution. I would like to move on to uh, Lydia Pereira. Um, she's president of uh, YEP and very active in the discussions on climate change and was part of the European Parliament's, uh, Parliament's official delegation to the United Nations for the Climate Change Conference. Um, Lydia, when we face the consequences of the Russian war and experience the Russian blackmail concerning energy supplies, we need to discuss how young politi politicians like yourself can defend democracy. Also by speeding up the green transition that will lead to energy independence from Russian gas, oil and coal. And what is your vision towards the role of young Christian democratic politicians? Hello, good morning. Um, and thank you very much to the um, Committee of the Regions, uh, to EPP, for inviting me once again to take part in your, in your dialogue. Um, and to address a few ideas uh, for reflection uh, that can be used um, also. And I think we, we use more things that are done at the local level, but I think it's also good that we have the possibility to exchange with um, uh, more the, the local level, which is sometimes I think a bit neglected in the process of the decision-making uh, in, uh, in the European Union, even though um, in my role as MEP, I always take into great consideration the decisions and the political positions of the Committee of the Regions um, in the, 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 the different topics that I cover, in particular uh, environment. I will start by the end of your question. Um, the topic of environment is a Christian demo Democrat topic. It's caring about our planet. It's uh, the pastor. Uh, with uh, uh, its ships that takes care about take, takes care of the land. So this is our topic. This is conservatism um, is the ideology that has been addressing since its very beginning uh, the the problematic of environment in the sense that caring preserving. Um, but somehow you know our societies they became more complex due to. Uh, the inclusion of topics that were not so much um, in the political agenda. Environment has been in, on the political agenda, but climate change 100 years ago was not. And now it is. 
because now we are witnessing the power of climate change and seeing at the, at, in towns and cities, the communities that some of climate change effects are uh, no longer reversible. So they will stay in, uh, in the long and medium term if we don't mitigate, but also if we don't adapt, because this is another side of uh, environmental policy. So this to say that um, uh, in, environment as a whole is a conservative topic. It should be on, to on the top of the political agenda, but somehow we lost it. We lost it to the socialists, to the greens, to the liberals. Um, and uh, we are now in a process, the center-right across Europe, we are a little bit at crossroads and we have to understand uh, where our voters went. Some of them went to more radical parties. Younger voters seem to be moving to green parties, liberal parties. And where are we in the political spectrum? Um, and actually, when we discuss about the implications of climate change at the local level, it's about the mayors of towns that will have to develop plans to address climate change effects. So how do we combine all of this? That's why I'm talking about complexity. Um, uh, so I think um, we have um, the duty uh, to claim, to reclaim uh, environment as one of the main drivers uh, in younger voters, uh, but also to recognize the impacts on communities. Because so far, it seems like it's not... Uh, it, it, I mean, Green Deal has been changing. I don't like the term Green Deal, actually, but uh, it's what we have and we have to use it. But uh, what I think is that we can no longer kind of neglect that environment is one of the main priorities of our voters. Um, so the, 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 in relation to environment or energy transition, what I want also to add is the following. Uh, environment and climate change did not have much public support if we look back 10 years ago, but it changed. And it was driven by younger, uh, the younger generation. And today we don't see anyone questioning climate change. Now what we are witnessing with the war in Ukraine is that we don't even have to accelerate our energy transition due to climate change, but also because of energy independence. So these are the, the, the two... <laughs> Um, uh, I mean, two elements or two factors that sh that should trigger a faster energy transition. And let me just conclude with the following. If we want to accelerate the transition, we cannot have planned, pro planned projects. For example, the energy interconnections between the Iberian Peninsula and France um, kind of blocked um, until 2029. We have to and block and harness the potential of the energy transition also in our independence from um, uh, fossil fuels that come from third countries. Being the urge of you wanting to speed it up, like as part of a, you're saying from this should be on the top of the agenda. There's a political and momentum. Let's, exactly. let's use it. That let's use it. We've been losing it the past couple of yes. years, but now we're all looking in the same direction and this is the moment. And I see... Um, uh, Mr. Paust uh, nodding very enthusiastically, so I think that he's getting the message. And I'm hoping that a lot of you is, is getting the message as well, because I think this is really important that we're saying from, well, sustainability should be on top. It should be on top of the list, just like the environment. Um, and this is the way to get it back. Could you um, uh, be more precise about, like, if there is one step that you would like to take now uh, with the people sitting here, what would that be? Well, I think um, when we, um, I, I, I see, I have the opportunity to meet with mayors from uh, mostly from Portuguese towns, but also in, at the international level. And here is the, a good example. Um, but I think when we, um, when we develop a plan for a town, um, and if we want that plan to be successful, which this is reasoning can be perfectly transposed for you know, the decision-making process at the European level. We have to involve all the stakeholders um, because this is not, um, uh, th these political actions cannot be taken individually and not embrace 
all the stakeholders that are going to be affected by those. And these be it uh, organizations, enterprises, uh, communities, neighborhoods, and so on. So I think um, uh, we often say that there's kind of a divorce in politics or between politicians and voters. Um, but I think politicians have a, a duty or they're in their role as politician to, to kind of remarry with the, with, if there's a divorce, there's always the possibility for remarry with, the, with their voters and involve them in the decision. What I've been witnessing is that there's a lot of people that complain and say, oh, people don't care about this or that. No, it's not true. They care. They just want to be filled part of that uh, in whatever decision we take. Thank you. So we have to make sure that people are connected again with us, with the politicians. I think that's the most important part. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I would like to go to uh, Michel uh, Rogier. Uh, Michel Rogier is uh, our uh, professional party leader in South Holland. We, we come from the same district and even the same city. Uh, as part of South Holland, we have two major cities, Rotterdam and The Hague. And um, well, of course, Michel, would you like to tell me a little bit about the challenges that your region, our region actually faces due to the energy crisis? Yes, well, welcome in the welcome in Rotterdam, uh, the, the city and part of the province of uh, south of Holland, my region. And we're talking about our regions, our towns, and how can we help each other? Welcome. And traditionally, we are here in the lowest part of, uh, of Holland and actually the lowest part of Europe. That's why we have one of the biggest harbors here and transport so many goods. And we do struggle. We do struggle with uh, with the water. Uh, and and we turning its force in a flexibility way uh, to advantage to keep our houses and farmlands dry by sophisticated irrigation and systems and make rather than one of the biggest harbors of uh, of, of transports in Europe and produce food uh, at large scale in our greenhouses and so it's struggling um, uh, every every year every day. And uh, Lydia also said, yes, yeah, every new challenge is a collaboration of government, companies, and cen centers of scientific knowledge. And young and matured workers work together here in this region. And uh, earlier um, uh, acquired knowledge and new out of the box uh, 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 creative minds of younger people, they help us out with, with problems, with the struggles that we have. And, um, and yeah, the challenge that we face here, uh, uh, caused by worldwide disruptions such as Brexit, COVID-19, the blockade of the Suez Channel, and certainly not in the last place, the devastating war in Ukraine, that, uh, that these are worldwide developments uh, that having its impact in, uh, in all parts of Europe and also here in this part. And uh, we do face that, and, but we hold on to each other. And uh, if you look at the um, uh, the companies that we have in, in South Holland, we're of course very big with transport, very big with flowers, um, food uh, produce, they all require energy. Have you got some examples of how they cope? Yeah, they do require energy. Uh, Rotterdam is one of the biggest ports in uh, Europe that transport coal and oil uh, to uh, to other parts of, uh, of, of Europe which is very necessary, of course. And uh, not only uh, is that a struggle here in Rotterdam, but Rotterdam also uh, faced it all earlier. Eh? And uh, Lydia mentioned it, that we had to take that path road to change uh, our way to use energy. And Rotterdam did that, and Rotterdam is busy with that. But the, the urge of sense raised, of course, because of the war. And we do have the climate change, but now we have another situation uh, on our hands as well to speed up. We had to speed up and not uh, stop, not, no, not no, no, stop. no, 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 no. <laughs> and uh, we depending on, uh, on, on the youngsters here among us to keep that train rolling, really. And you did a carbon free uh, campaign. You did that very well. Thank you for that. But it inspires us. It inspires us. And all these new knowledges and universities, the high schools, these kids are helping us out with the problems that we have to deal. I mean, uh, in 62, uh, someone said, we're going to put a man on the moon. And but that's what we have to do here as well. We, we have to change the way we uh, 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 use our energy. Yep. We have to change the way that we use the energy and the gas. Yep. And with the new energy of the young people. Of course. Uh, yep. 
that would yeah. help people like us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and what we do, what, yeah. And uh, if I mention uh, another thing that here in Holland we do have, uh, of course, uh, not that much sun as you might notice, uh, but we do have wind. And on the North Sea only, uh, this coming years we have twelve hundred wind turbines on the North Sea. That's going to help us uh, with uh, uh, hydro hydrogen energy. Uh, the, the the factories in the harbor have to change from all to that uh, kind of source. Uh, but also we have uh, uh, geometrical um, uh, uh, the, the, the geom uh, geothermal geothermal heating. Yeah, thank yes. you very much. Uh, we, we do have that system here as well. Our greenhouses are a good example of that. And uh, one of the companies who are here on the market, Copper Crest, they started already in 2010 to change. And uh, nowadays they uh, don't have to use 1.8 million uh, 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 tons of gas uh, anymore. That's, that's huge each year. And they encourage other companies here uh, in this part of, uh, uh, of, of, of Holland to heat up the greenhouses where they have huge uh, food productions to use that kind of energy. And it, that inspires us as well. Yeah. That's a nice example. So you're, you're saying that uh, the south of Holland is, is one of the biggest uh, producers of food through greenhouses. And one of the problems always, has always been the gas and the heating. And they're tackling that right now so that they're very energy efficient, which is good for the environment and, of course, good for the Ukrainian people indirectly. Yeah. And what, 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 a, what a good thing is to mention and to point out that these companies are sharing their knowledge. Uh, these companies, these universities, these high schools, they share what they develop, they share what they invent, they share it with the whole uh, world. So please join uh, uh, my trip to the to the marketplace where we can visit these companies who want to help us out, who help us out in Europe, help Ukraine as well. Well, thank you very much. Um, are there any questions that you would like to, to ask? Yes, please. Um, is there someone with a microphone? Thank you. Thank you, Wietzke. My name is Rijn Willems, a former senator in the Netherlands. I have a question to I think all three of you, but first I'd like to thank Lily for the fact that she really uh, raised an issue which is very important for the Christian Democrats, that we have to get back to at attending and uh, spending time on the real issues that people are looking at and not leave that to other parties, which we have done so far, particularly in the Netherlands, although I'm happy to see things changing in our country. The question I have to all three of you is, you're talking about energy um, and and I'd like to be and, and food on the one uh, on the other hand. Do you think there is a, should be a time at the moment to reinstate a really European uh, agricultural policy for food production? Uh, and that will and, and that's not to uh, ensure that U Ukraine is not going to be supplying anymore, but that we can, uh, in fact, uh, replace Russia at certain at a certain stage in the world and b become an exporter. I think we we could really develop a strong. Uh, agricultural policy there again. I know many countries are trying to get rid of agricultural policies, but Europe is strong in this, particularly in the technolog technological side as well. I'd like to have your views on that. And secondly, on the energy side, I hear you talk about uh, hydrogen, um, uh, uh, green hydrogen, sorry, in, in, in Nîmes. What, what's the method of producing that? Are you doing that with wind energy or are there other ways of doing that? Could I give the floor to you, please? Yes. Um, sur la première question, c'est une très bonne réflexion. Uh, je pense que... Excellent comment. I believe you have uh, food research, you also have the environment, and also you have economy. And when we talk about the environment and the new common agricultural policy, we're talking about uh, redefining uh, the economy from A to Z. I'll explain. You have demographics, uh, you have uh, evolutions at the level of the African continent amongst other continents. If our agriculture, um, uh, if we modernize our agriculture with new trade, we use satellites, all the new technologies, uh, this will mean uh, extra jobs, new jobs. So we have to focus on training and also Europe can be really at the center of the world uh, can and concerning renewable energies 
we should not be naive here in Europe. When we talk about uh, uh, manufacturing uh, hydrogen, 10 years ago, when I was uh, at the European Parliament, the five first companies were European companies. Uh, I'm talking about manufacturing uh, solar panels. It's no longer the case today. The five first leaders of the market are Chinese. When we talk about reindustrializing, we need to focus on these new trades, meaning that at a European level, Erasmus, um, we need to recreate training in line with these new trades. We need to uh, make sure that we're doing what it takes at uh, the level of European um, continent. We need to dot the I's, cross the T's. If you take uh, talk about uh, uh, agriculture of tomorrow, all these new trades, uh, we're talking about wealth. Moreover, we're talking about jobs uh, that will remain in Europe. Let's take advantage, I would say, of uh, this change of behavior, this awareness at a European level, we need to look for. We need to look for new trades, and we need to bring back our production pools in Europe. We need to resolve the water problem. Water, I repeat, very important. Without water, you have no agriculture. And today, for instance, at the level of my territory, there are natural catastrophes. And uh, water is there, but we need uh, to have water retention also, of course. Thank you. It's, it's also a plea for keeping the knowledge here, developing the knowledge and also the produ uh, production uh, of energy and agriculture. Uh, Misha, would you like to respond? Yeah, keeping, keeping the knowledge here and, and uh, develop the knowledge here, that's very important. Uh, I think every European country faces uh, uh, that we don't have that much personnel anymore, and it's it's the, to, to help us out with these developments to change it to uh, to a new kind of energy. And uh, but it's very uh, very important that we use our students, that we raise our students how to develop this this uh, and, and to help us out with this but you have to have your own knowledge here otherwise we're going to have a really good hard time yeah and a good cooperation within the european union of course, of course with the erasmus yep. program yeah I, th I think um what is relevant to to take into consideration is that when we talk about strategic autonomy it also um me or is extensible to the uh, food sector um, but we have to do it um, in respecting the environment meaning that we cannot uh, require that from our farmers um, more demanding rules than for the others uh, from third that we import from third countries right um, so uh, i think otherwise we are creating here uh, uh, there is no level playing field and this is a problem uh, for European farmers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I would say that uh, a common agricultural policy uh, has to have as a central role or as a central pillar, uh, more um, correctly said, um, uh, the, uh, the, the autonomy uh, for food sector. Um, I think this is crucial and we are seeing that uh, as time goes by and uh, witnessing the challenges particularly reflected by the by the war uh, and i would take on uh, what was uh, said and now by michelle about the knowledge and the know-how that we develop in europe um, because we have now different technologies um, that allow the production of certain products um, that was not possible in the past so uh, we have that as um, a tool, as an instrument, technologies that can harness the potential uh, for food production that was not something credible, like say 30 years ago, for example. Oh. And uh, just one last note for the problem in relation to uh, uh, the climate and, and um, access to water. Um, if we look at the south of Europe, it's particularly affected by climate change according to the IPCC report, is one of the regions that is supposed to be mostly affected. Um, and uh, uh, and so we need, I, I referred that in the beginning, we need adaptation not to be uh, put as a, you know, a second thing to do. It has to be a combined and integrated approach that involves also adaptation due to the fact that without water, it's oh. more difficult as well for certain products to be um, uh, to be uh, to be pr uh, produced, 
um, and uh, and people need to have access to water. So uh, I would say that this is um, the main takeaway here is that strategic, strategic autonomy also as a pillar of the common agriculture policy, respecting the environmental standards that Europe um, uh, negotiates with third countries when we have uh, when we sign trade deals. But this is also have has to be combined with with these uh, pressing um, challenges that we have. Well, thank you very much. And I also hear you all say that we have to work together with the agriculture sector and not talk about them. So that's a big difference as well. Doing it. And the narrative cannot be seen as against. Exactly. When we well, we had the, the strategy from farm to fork, right? And there was a bit of resistance. Uh, but I think the potential of technology is not yet fully, you know, in the equation. Um, and we also have to represent and speak to our farmers, but they also have to see that there's more to explore with the technology development and be ready to prepare because we know digitalization is going to uh, probably uh, come, uh, we, we will we'll, uh, we'll eventually take some jobs, but we'll create many others in the sense of agriculture wise the same. Uh, so we have to, um, you know, have this more positive uh, addressing um, towards this specific topic, which is agriculture, but say it in the way, well, we are not against, we are with you, we oh. just have to uh, exactly. boost ourselves. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you very much for this, uh, this conclusion. I'd like to thank all the three of you for, for coming here and sharing uh, your story. Um, thank you very much. I would like to ask Mr. Apostolos Chitroskas to the stage, please. Um, well, thank you very much. I would like to stand here, please. Um, Mr. President, under your strong leadership, the European Committee of the Regions, together with all the mayors that we have, the presidents, the local councillors across the EU, we're very quick to respond to the Ukraine crisis uh, through a number of initiatives that we had. And you've shown solidarity, compassion, and a welcoming heart. I'd like to thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, dear President Geblevich, my good friend Olged, uh, dear Miss Yehorova Lutsenko, thank you for taking the time to come here with us today. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, let me warmly thank, first of all, the Dutch delegation for their hospitality and, in particular, the CDA for organizing the Congress and hosting our side event today. Let me also thank all of you for your hard work over these last three months, keeping vibrant our partnership with our colleagues in Ukraine. I'm deeply moved by the mobilization and the decisiveness of uh, local and regional authorities all throughout our union to stand with the Ukrainian people, providing shelter and help to the refugees from Ukraine is not only a duty. It is an investment for peace in our continent, in Europe. Now, for many years, Regions and cities at the borders of the European Union have called for solidarity and a common European policy for refugees. Today, it is finally evident that the burden has to be shared. That solidarity is the only solution that only united we can tackle challenges and solve problems. We saw this during the past migration crisis when many countries like mine, Greece, were left alone to deal with the migration crisis. But these crises, my dear friends, are not an issue for one, two or three countries that are right at the border. This issue is a European issue. And I'm really happy to see that under difficult times, Europe learns from its mistakes 
and moves on. And let me spell it out clearly. It is thanks to the EPP family that our colleagues, the mayors of Ukraine, have found support during these turbulent times, starting from the mayor of Kiev, our good friend Klinsko, members of our EPP family, and now honorary member of our committee. And I would really like to thank my dear colleagues. In particular, President Geblevich, Mayor Durkievich, Mayor Bok, Mayor Traskovsky, President Wozniak, President Linek, for this amazing work they have done. I visited these regions. I visited these mayors. And I saw what it means to be a leader on the ground in difficult times. And I think all of, I would like to thank all of our colleagues in the EPP group who in their regions, in their cities, they are providing to the Ukrainian people and families, not just shelter, but hope. And let me further encourage all of us to use the tools we have put at our disposal for helping our Ukrainian friends, such as the possibility of hosting accompanied minors for summer camps in Europe that Mayor Klinsko asked for, or by using the COR Info Support Hub in order to match the needs and offers in providing shelter to the refugees, or gathering and sending humanitarian aid whenever and wherever is needed. Now, we saw during our last plenary in April how the mayors of Ukraine turned to us and through the European Committee of Regions, they made their calls for help heard in the entire European Union. But also beyond the group, the EPP is making today difference at every level. President Metzola, European Parliament, traveled to Kiev as the first EU official meeting President Zelensky during the war. The EPP is leading by example in these very, very difficult times. Manfred Weber and Donald Tusk are on the forefront fighting against the Kremlin's nationalism. It is thanks to leaders of our political family that we have built a union of peace after years of war and destruction, a union which has become a benchmark for peace, stability, and sustainable growth. Russian nationalism has now triggered a new war in Europe. We must offer all possible means to our Ukrainian friends who are fighting for our values, for the values we share. And they deserve a future in the European Union. So I really wish that in June, the Council will decide to accept to Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia as candidate countries. It is now the time to do that. Dear colleagues, from the outset of the invasion, cities and regions have been the first to send humanitarian aid and welcome refugees without resorting to the right of veto, without negotiations, misunderstandings or understatements. Local and regional authorities have simply been active, present, and supportive. Since Maidan, the Committee of Regions, led by the EPP, has paved the way for fruitful cooperation with Ukraine's young democracy at all levels of governance. And Ukraine's recent decentralization process has enabled its neighbors and regional leaders to build up resilience. Indeed, the crucial role of Ukrainian mayors during the war has shown how important has been the forging of direct links between authorities and the people. Mayors of Ukraine are today the pillars of resilience, and they will be the pillars of reconstruction. Building on this decentralization process, President Zelensky has asked EU regions and cities during the meeting we had a month ago to establish twinning 
agreements with our Ukrainian counterparts with a view to the reconstruction of infrastructure of villages and cities that were destroyed. Presidents Zelensky and Michel have both asked the European Committee of Regions to provide expertise and know-how in order to achieve this reconstruction process. And last week, a communication of the European Commission framed the way forward for reconstruction with a clear role for cities and regions via to peer-to-peer -peer cooperation. Now, in this context, and following the example of the Cohesion Alliance, together with the mayor of Gdansk, I have proposed to build a new alliance, a new alliance of cities and regions for the reconstruction of Ukraine from the bottom up. The main European associations have already positively replied to our call. And now I would like to call on you to be ready to put at the disposal of this alliance your know-how contributing to the conferences that will follow on Ukraine's reconstruction. We're really looking forward to our Ukrainian partners. The know-how of our respective regional and local administration and our best practices on spatial and urban planning. We will be there during Ukraine's reconstruction. And to this end, a reconstruction facility must be created soon. And we need to make sure that it will be directly accessible for European, local and regional leaders. Whenever they need it, however they need it, Europe needs to be there. Our forthcoming June plenary will be indeed the occasion to make this important call together. So my dear friends, once again, let me reiterate the very crucial and important role that local and regional leaders are playing on the ground, not only facing the crisis with the war, but at the same time, fighting for the citizens, for their everyday lives, for giving them a better life. I visited Cruz Napoca last month, Mayor Bok, and I saw how at the same time that his administration is having to deal with the refugee crisis, he and his administration is on top of every single problem. So the priorities might have changed because of the crisis, but our leaders, the leaders of the EPP in municipalities, villages, cities, or regions are there to fight for their citizens as well, not stopping for one day the very important work that they have been doing. And so again, I congratulate you. And I conclude by saying, my dear colleagues, that now is the time to join forces and work together to build the future of Ukraine in Europe from the bottom up, just as we believe that the future of Europe should be built bottom up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your words. Um, well, thank you all very much. We come to an end, but we have two things left on the agenda, two smaller things. Um, we would like to take a, a family photo with all of us together, but before we do that, uh, I would like to ask Mr. Gibberich uh, back, please, on stage. Um, and I would like to ask the delegates who have voting rights to stay within the room. Well, maybe the family photo can be first. Yeah, just figure out. Can we? Come up here for the family photo, please. So we'll do the family photo first. Okay. Sorry for the confusion. Okay. No